welcome to the second Easter webcast recorded by your friends at Grace Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Neil. Even though most people in our country think of Easter as a single day each year, the church has long proclaimed that Easter is a season God can use to encourage us in faith and free us from our fears. Today's Bible reading has been a big part of that process for centuries. It describes a man best known as Doubting Thomas. But Jesus did not see him as a weakling. Jesus saw him as a treasure who he wanted to redeem. Thus, whether you come to worship on this day, filled with faith and confidence, or filled with doubt and fears, this story brings good news to you. With that word of encouragement, let us tune our hearts for worship and for praise. This morning, we will be leading you in the call to worship. The church has long proclaimed that Easter is a turning point for all Christians in the world. On that first Easter morning, the power of death was broken. The gates of hell were opened, and the faithful one who died to free us from our sins came back to life again. At times, we all have struggled with sin and fear and doubt. But the good news of this season does not depend on us. The good news of this season depends on Jesus Christ, who lived and died and rose again for us. Therefore, let us worship God.
Hello, boys and girls. It's so good to see you today. I'm picturing some of my favorite people this morning sitting right out there with you, including Kenna and Cosette, Sophie and Kate, Brixton and Kellen, Victoria and Jude, and another pair I learned about just this week, watching all the way from Rhode Island, Bryce and Blake Miyaki. It's so good to see both of you. I hope you children have been helpful to your parents during these last few weeks of quarantine. I also hope you found some fun things to do together. One fun thing that my family used to do when we had several hours to spare is to solve puzzles. And there's some truly gorgeous puzzles out there. Here's one that's full of wildlife, including elephants and zebras, with hippopotamus as well. Here's one that shows a dolphin leaping way up in the air. Isn't that cool? And here's one that shows a lovely woman riding on a huge cat way up in the sky. I think that one's cool as well. But if you looked at each of those carefully, you might notice just one flaw. Did you catch it? If not, I'll show you one more. What is it? That's right. There is a missing piece. Some puzzles are so busy and so crowded we hardly notice, at least from a distance. But other puzzles make that missing piece very, very clear. The reason I bring that up is that God sees each one of us as one piece of a puzzle. That puzzle is called the church. And much like this jigsaw puzzle, God wants to make it beautiful. He wants to make it grand. And he needs every single one of us to do that. Today's Bible story is about a person who was missing from the church at a very important time. Some folks would not have noticed that have just forgotten him and moved on. But Jesus noticed. Jesus missed him. And Jesus would not rest until that man was found. So, when you feel left out or overlooked, Remember that Christ is looking, not just for you, but for every member of your family. Because every single piece of this puzzle we call church matters a great deal to him. With that, let us pray. Dear God, thank you that you made us. Thank you that you save us. Thank you that you draw us to yourself. Even those who might seem irritating in some ways are quite valuable to you. So help us, God, to love them and cherish them just as Jesus would. For we ask it in his holy name. Amen. Thanks, gang. I look forward to seeing you next week. One of the great joys we get from young children is their honesty. Trusting in our love, they rarely find the need to hide. Scripture teaches that God responds to us in much that same way. Thus, it is appropriate in every service of worship to give to God in prayer, confessing our failures and trusting his grace. Encouraged by the story of his mercy, I invite you to join me in this morning's prayer of confession. We confess, confess o, o sovereign, sovereign God, God to the, to the doubts, doubts mixed with our faith. faith. You, you have brought, brought us a long way through life, but there have been some hard times when we have doubted your word, questioned your, your love, and ignored the promises we made to you. Lift us out of the narrow circles of self-concern that imprison us in limited vision and flawed wisdom. Then comfort us 
with mystery enough to change us and grace enough to cleanse us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news of the gospel. Scripture teaches that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In the name of Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
having been reminded that God's grace finds us, both in our blessings and our trials, we often use this time in worship to share some of those experiences with friends and family members who are watching, both near and far. I'd like to begin this morning by thanking those of you who chose to submit their own pictures full of face mask fashions, a new section on our website. You can check out the Hollingsworths today and the Hansons. That section's looking better day by day, but we still need shots from you. I'd also like to thank the Childress family for submitting this really cute picture of Cosette leading us in worship during the children's time last Sunday. That photo really made my day. If you've got cute kid pics that you'd like to submit for Easter Sunday or just for spring, we'd love to see them and put them on the website. Just send them to the address now listed on your screen. A number of families have expressed interest in joining our congregation, and it's possible to do that too. You can join us for a new member class on Zoom this Saturday morning at 9 a.m., We call that class Discover Grace, and we use it to explain the good news of who God is, who we are, and how we can be connected one to another. If that sounds promising to you, just drop us a note at the email address listed on your screen, and we'll send out a link for you. If your kids are starting to get bored these days, we've also added lots of new lessons and downloads to the Children's Church section of our website. And most of these can be done at any time. There are lessons on forgiveness, for example, and obedience and healing. All that's pretty appropriate, I think, in these days. We're also considering the creation of a children's Sunday school class on Zoom. That way, they can see their friends they've missed from the church. If that thought sounds promising to you or your kids, just send us an email here at the church and we will follow up with you. Moving on to more serious topics, I'm sorry to report that the beloved relatives of three church members passed away recently and all three of these relatives were under the age of 30. We mentioned the Boitano's grandson, Jacob, a few weeks ago. Last week, we learned that Marty Trekman lost her grandson, Wade. And this week, we learned that Bob and Joan Blecken lost their nephew, Stephen. So it's a tough time for all three of those families. Jadira Kailama asks us to pray for all those fighting COVID-19, including her friend, Ken, now on a respirator. Ken Wasson asks us to remember his friend, Chaplain Lloyd Lassard, also fighting that illness. And several young people need our prayers following loss of employment caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, I'm sure you'll want to remember the families of our first responders, especially Terrell Young and David Worksman, the Riverside County deputies who recently lost their lives while transporting sick patients from the uh, jail to a medical center. As far as I know, no member of this church has been diagnosed with COVID-19, but I hope the pictures of these officers will remind us why we still need to stay inside even on these beautiful spring days. With that thought in mind, let us go to God in prayer. Gracious and holy God, We thank you for the privilege of living in this community where most of us have safe and decent housing in which to live. We also thank you for those who make this living possible. First, we thank you for those who dare to risk their lives for us during the COVID-19 pandemic, doctors, nurses, deputies, EMTs, and so on. Second, we thank you for those outside the healthcare industry who provide essential services, food, shelter, power, gas, electricity, and so on. Third, we thank you for the members of our community who've gone out of their way to support us, providing us with groceries and teaching us new skills for this day and age. Help us to learn well. 
then help us use these skills to bless the lives of others. For we ask it in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Of my Father's love begotten, ere the worlds began to be, He is Alpha and Omega, He the source, the ending He. Of the things that are that In the Bible passage that we read last week, the women who Jesus loved experienced the victory of the risen Christ, begotten of the Father, united with the Spirit for all time. But the men who Jesus loved missed that resurrection morn. This week, John's Gospel tells us how the male followers of Christ met with the risen Lord, but one follower one very important follower was missing. His name was Thomas. So John's gospel quickly turns to the challenges that were created by him. With that preview in mind, I invite you to listen now for his witness to the peace and love found in our risen Lord. On the very first Easter Sunday, Jesus' disciples gathered behind locked doors for fear of the Jews. But Jesus came and stood among them, saying, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again he said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus appeared to them on Resurrection Sunday. So when the other disciples said, We have seen the Lord, Thomas said to them, Unless I place my finger into the nail mark of his hands and place my hand into the wound mark on his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, 
his disciples were gathered inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them, saying, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, See my hands, and put your finger here. Then put your hand into my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. This is the word of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I'd be rather disappointed if I were known throughout the ages as Doubting Neil. I'd rather be faithful Neil, loyal Neil, truthful Neil, helpful Neil, almost anything but Doubting Neil. Of course, the truth is there have been times in my life when I wrestled mightily with doubt, especially in my younger years. Struggle's less strong now, but it still flares up now and then. I think that's true for many of us. It's just part of being human. But fortunately, for those of us who long to follow Christ in our day and age, our struggles are not recorded in God's Word for all the world to see. Thomas was not so fortunate in this morning's text Instead, his struggle has become iconic. His name became linked to doubt, just like Honest Abe became a pseudonym for that American president. But it was not always so. During most of John's gospel, he was better known as Didymus, the twin, though no one knows exactly who the twin brother was. And after reading the 11th chapter of John's Gospel, you might have easily called him Bold Thomas, because he's the one who exhorted his fellow disciples to follow Jesus to Judea, that we might die with him. Those are pretty strong words. But those are not the words for which this disciple finally became known. Instead, he became known for the words quoted in this text, unless I put my finger into the nail mark of his hands and place my hand into the wound upon his side, I will not believe. Those are also strong words. The beauty of those words is their clarity. This is what I need to believe. And the greatest defenders of faith throughout history have often staked out ground like that. They've got to have evidence. They've got to have proof. These are people like C.S. Lewis, Josh McDowell, Lee Strobel, and so on. They know what they need, or they think they do. And they dig up lots of evidence in the process, evidence that can be helpful to folks like you and me. Many times they started out as skeptics, But God surprised them. God has a way of doing that. An amazing way of making us see things we didn't plan to see and hear things we didn't plan to hear. Especially in John's Gospel, Christ loves to work that way. He brings a different kind of proof. It sort of overwhelms our intellect and undermines our doubt. In this morning's text, for example, Thomas laid it out. I got a touch, finger here, hand there. Nothing else will do. Yet from everything we can tell, he never did that. He never did touch the Lord. Instead, when Christ invited him to do so, he immediately declared, my Lord and my God. He didn't see anything different at that point that his fellow disciples had seen one week before, but in that moment and that day, it was enough. There are so many sweet details in this text, including a first offering of the Holy Spirit along with Jesus' power to forgive. That's a big deal, a really big deal that's often missed. Another one is locked doors. Both on Easter Sunday and the Sunday after that, the disciples were in no mood to receive guests, but they got one nonetheless in the person of Christ the Lord. 
Still another sweet detail is Christ's offer of peace. Peace be with you. And this one you cannot miss, or at least you should not miss it, because Christ says it three times. Twice on Easter Sunday, once the week after that. Peace be with you. You might almost think he meant it. You might almost think that Easter was somehow connected with that offer. And you'd be right. You'd be absolutely right. You see, Thomas was not a skeptic in the classic sense of the word. He was not an atheist, not a critic of his Savior or God's word. From everything we can tell, he loved Christ deeply, personally, passionately. Let's go and die with him But Thomas was a man in conflict, both with others and with himself. We don't know why he was absent from the group on Easter night. Perhaps he was angry with the group. Perhaps he felt guilty that he had missed his chance to die. Perhaps he was in shock. Perhaps he was an introvert who simply needed some time to grieve the death of Christ alone. We don't know why he was absent. We just know he wasn't there. It took him a week to resolve it, the turmoil in his soil. It took him a week to return to the group. And in that week, they changed. Suddenly, they were hopeful, optimistic, joyful. He didn't. He was still living in grief and shock. And because of that, He felt very emotionally distant from the group. He was alienated. He was left behind. But Jesus was not willing to leave this man behind. Jesus was determined to bring this man peace as well. Peace be with you, Jesus said. Touch if you have to. But do not doubt me believe. So what does this story mean for us today? Three things I think are key. First, Jesus said, just before explaining the work of the Holy Spirit the night he was about to die, he said, I've told you these things so that in me you might have peace. This doesn't mean an absence of conflict, of problems, of stress. In fact, Christ says you will have troubles. But he also says in that verse, I've overcome them. If Christ has overcome them, then we can do so too. He lived and died and rose again to show us how. Second, there are many things that we do to block Christ's path of peace. It's not just locked doors. There's locked minds. There's locked hearts. There's ultimatums. Like those first disciples, we think we're blocking out our pain. I've already been burned. I don't want more. In truth, we're blocking out our healing, the healing that comes from Christ. Fortunately, in this morning's text, it's also very clear That Jesus does what must be done to break through. There's such a great paradox here. First, he goes through locked doors. Mortals can't do that. Jesus is more like a ghost in that sense. But then when Thomas needs a body he can touch, Christ provides it. He gives him what he needs. And the same thing's true of us. Those of us who've had a lot of education can easily create all sorts of barriers to faith. Barriers that Christ graciously transcends. I'm talking about lists, proofs, historical research. There's value in all that. The greatest defenders of faith throughout history have used it. Most of them started out as skeptics, but changed Because God met them in the process. God flipped all that upside down. That's because in the final analysis, strong faith is not really built on strong arguments. 
checklists, proofs, research. Strong faith is built upon a strong relationship with God in Jesus Christ. It's not an intellectual thing. It's a personal thing. After all, the reason we study Scripture is to know Christ, who he is, what he did, what that means for you and me. And if you study it long enough, something happens. Something changes deep within. God moves you. God touches you. God sends a word to you, and you know it. It's personal. When that happens, you know God in much the same way you know a spouse or a parent or a friend. Of course, you can always learn more. That's why we have four Gospels, one apostolic narrative, and 21 letters in the New Testament. Each one tells us something different about the God we know in Christ and how to live in him. But when you meet Christ in John's Gospel, it's personal. It really is. Thus, it doesn't really matter whether you see yourself as a skeptic or a sinner Nor does it matter whether other folks see you as a hero or a failure in some sense. What matters is how Christ sees you. Christ sees you as a brother or a sister for whom he lived and died. When you're absent, he misses you. Not only that, he chooses to come back for you. You might want to start an argument. You might want to set lots of criteria, and you might want to demand all sorts of proof. But once you start to see who Jesus really is, and once you understand that he really is reaching out to you, there's only one response that makes sense. It's the same response that Thomas had. My Lord and my God. With that, let us pray. Dear Lord, none of us were there when you first appeared to your chosen band on Easter Sunday. We didn't live at that time in history. Since we did not see your face or touch your hand, it's easy for us to be skeptical It's easy to feel left out, easy to intellectualize, set commissions, conditions, demand all sorts of proof. But when we finally see who Jesus is and what he did for us, none of that really matters anymore. So help us, God, to live in relationship with Christ, for he's the one who saves us. He's the one who calls us, and he's the one who bore the cross for us. Amen.
Now may the God of peace, who brought back our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, make you complete in everything good, working in us to stir faith, working with us to bring hope, working alongside us to bring love, until all your friends can see that Jesus Christ is risen within you. Amen.